Okay, so the first question is about the evacuation. Um, so a couple of weeks ago, we evacuated North Lincoln Hospital during the wildfire crisis. Can you tell what happened, how that decision was made to evacuate, what role Pacific communities played, and then also what goes into evacuating and then returning to a hospital? Yes, we have had some experiences that have made us uh, more well-rounded <laughs> people in the, in the last few weeks. Um, Tragically, uh, the Echo Mountain fire complex uh, that started out as, as small fires um, on uh, uh, just after Labor Day weekend coalesced and uh, we came back from our Labor Day um, uh, uh, day off that many of us had um, to find that um, the wildfire was presenting um, a very real threat to the North Lincoln City area. And um, we first saw it uh, progress through the, the Otis and Rose Lodge area. And then um, by uh, Wednesday after Labor Day, um, I believe that was the 10th, uh, we were seeing evacuation uh, levels extend down into the very north part of, um, of Lincoln City. Um, we were able to see the glow of fire across the lake and um, we uh, uh, were in the midst of lots of smoke and ash and, and all of those things um, that go along with the advancing fire. Um, also, by that time, we had had um, uh, quite the windstorm. Uh, overnight that of course had fed the fires, had caused lots of damage and uh, had taken out power as well between the fire and um, and uh, the um, uh, the winds. So uh, on that Tuesday and into that Wednesday, we were running on generator power, which of course we do quite frequently off and on with our coastal hospitals. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it is just a fact of life uh, living where we live. Uh, and, and that in itself is not a problem. Uh, we are required by law to have 96 hours of generator power. Um, at any of our hospitals and um, we learned a lot about our new hospital facility in North Lincoln that opened at the beginning of February, but we really had not uh, tested our generator for significant periods of time. Uh, we were able to uh, determine that that generator was um, using about 15 gallons of fuel per hour and at that rate we had many more uh, much more time than just 96 hours we actually calculated that we had up to about eight days of um of reserve and uh, that's without um, much conservation uh, so we we felt secure in that however the fire continued to progress it continued to get closer uh, we uh, did get an evacuation notice, uh, a go notice, a level three notice that extended as far down as far south as Holmes Road. The, the key part about Holmes Road is that um, with uh, our, our current circumstance, uh, there is some uh, uh, construction going on on West Devils Lake Road that is a south uh, access point for the hospital. Um, that uh, has been and, and still is blocked uh, and it is impassable. So um, our only uh, avenue for exit in a uh, to a south going direction um, is really uh, off of Holmes Road and that was the evacuation area that is about three blocks from the hospital. And so when that uh, area uh, got evacuated, uh, we were very concerned for a number of reasons. First, that being the evacuation route we would take, now it's full, clogged and full of people trying to evacuate themselves. Um, we were concerned about how fast we could actually evacuate patients in our hospital because, um, as you can imagine, uh, life goes on, 911 calls still go on, and um, we would require ambulances 
to um, to evacuate all of the patients. And so um, with uh, all of these factors, with the advancing fire that we could sort of see across the lake, with um, the smoke and ash and air quality being uh, so bad, with the evacuation level coming closer and closer and closer to the hospital and in fact in, involving our exit uh, pattern, our exit strategy. And then lastly, um, as these evacuation levels continued to roll out, these were involved a significant portion of our own uh, staff members. And so we had staff coming up to us saying, I've got to leave work. I've got to evacuate my home, my family, my pets. I've got to get out. And um, so we questioned our ability to continue to provide care uh, when uh, a significant portion of our staff needed to evacuate themselves and, and leave work. So for all of these reasons, uh, we decided uh, early that Wednesday morning uh, that we did need to, in fact, evacuate the hospital as well. Uh, we did um, this the decision making was not made in isolation, but it was made quickly. Uh, of course, we consulted people across um, the Samaritan hospital system. We consulted with our local fire authorities and county authorities um, and made that decision. Um, lo and behold, however, uh, with cooperation, with everybody pulling and a, a wildfire sort of nipping at our heels, we were able to evacuate the hospital in, in right around an hour. I, I would have never even told you it could have been done that quickly, but what an amazing team and uh, amazing partners in Pacific West Ambulance to be able to um, really make that happen. So I guess the next question is where do we evacuate to? So at, by that point, uh, Highway 101 North was blocked, Highway 18 going north and east was blocked, and really our only exit was Highway 101 South. Um, and then, of course, 28 miles down that road is Samaritan Pacific Communities Hospital in Newport, our sister hospital uh, that I also oversee. So um, the, the question there was, do we evacuate patients to that hospital? Do they have the ability to um, absorb our patients or do we need to go further inland um, and, and find other places? Well, we were very quickly able to assess. Uh, they had a, a morning census of about 10 patients on the inpatient side and they had uh, 15 other beds available in the hospital and they were very luckily able to take our nine inpatients um, and shift uh, all health care for our county to that location. And so how do we do that? Well, um, very luckily, uh, uh, a good uh, number of people who were uh, caring for patients were in North Lincoln Hospital were likewise able to accompany those patients. Um, not everybody that we would need to fully keep the hospital open, but enough that we could, um, we didn't leave um, Pacific Community stranded without enough people to actually care for patients. Because if you double your census in an hour, you, you really have to have um, the, the healthcare workers to take care of them. Um, we did this uh, not only with our inpatient units, but also with our emergency departments, because all of a sudden we went from two emergency departments in the county to just one. So we combined staffs there and we very much needed them. We actually implemented our surge plan um, at uh, that we had devised for COVID at Pacific Communities Hospital. We implemented that surge plan uh, for the wildfires and we expanded our emergency department into our pre and post surgical area and um, and we were able to absorb additional patients that way and that was made possible by addition of um, uh, doctors and nurses and other staff members from North Lincoln being able to to work at Pacific Communities and then likewise the last area that uh, everybody worked really well in um, was uh, our labor and delivery services uh, we had our physicians who again babies don't stop being born because we have a wildfire disaster and so we um, had 
uh, the expected mother's report to the Newport Hospital instead, and they found their obstetricians there and uh, staff there to take care of them just in a different location. So um, I, I will have to say uh, that I was so floored by the cooperation, the teamwork, uh, how everyone pulled together. It was amazing. And, and I'll tell you, um, it was scary and there were a lot of people who had their own concerns, um, their own families um, to worry about, their own situations, but the amount of people who, who put that aside and figured out ways to care for patients, it was um, just I, it just made me so proud and of course um so the very next day we start formulating what does it take to get us back into our hospital and so um on that uh thursday and friday of that week we saw the weather change the weather patterns change so that was great right the easterly winds stopped blowing so much we got higher humidity we got a little bit of rain and uh, we started seeing um, the fire get under better control so um, so as that started happening we also started seeing uh, the evacu evacuation levels reverse um, we saw that especially over that Friday, we were in very close contact with our county partners and also with Pacific Power because uh, we cannot restart some services like uh, elective surgeries without reliable power. We can do emergent surgeries uh, with a generator, but elective surgeries um, is something a little bit different. So we very much wanted to get back in and serve our community fully. And so we worked very closely with Pacific Power and by midweek the next week, we had all of our services back up and running. Um, but uh, we did successfully uh, reopen our hospital at 7 a.m. on Saturday. I believe that was the 12th, maybe. Um, and uh, we were able to pull together staffing and, um, and once again, despite their own uh, personal challenges, we had lots of people show up to work in some cases that had even lost their houses and they knew that by that time. So again, just amazing teamwork um, by lots of people um, to, to pull it back together and reopen. And um, we had to make sure that we didn't leave Pacific communities high and dry. So we had to make sure that staffing uh, was well coordinated um, across the coast, that everybody did it. Everybody made magic happen. So um, I just cannot say enough positive things about about everything that happened and uh, it was unfortunate. We, we wish we did not have to evacuate. Um, that's not ever a decision that I thought I would even be making, but um, and in hindsight, could we have stayed? Um, I think you could argue that maybe we could have cobbled together some um, some ways, maybe not idealized staffing, maybe we could have figured it out, but at the time with the threats, with the information that we had, um, we, we very much have validated that, that we made the right decision. So any questions? That was a lot of words. <laughs> I, I don't see any questions in the um, chat or any hands being raised, so we can move on to the next question. Before we do, I realized I had introduced myself before 12 o'clock, and so some of you may have come on and don't know who I am. So I am Ursula Marinelli, and I am the foundation director at the hospital here in Newport. Okay, so the next question, let's go from one crisis to another. The um, This is a question about COVID, and it, it was a very specific question from one of the, our participants, but I'll, t I'll ask it in kind of a general way. If somebody is traveling to our communities from, let's say, out of the country, um, and they're traveling as a family, so there's more than one person, uh, and they're, they're coming for the holidays and then they um, are, are planning to quarantine, to self-quarantine for 14 days before going to visit relatives who are in the high risk area, uh, you know, that high risk area of over, over 60 years old. Um, should they, could they also get a COVID test 
And if so, where would they get it? How much would it be? What would be like, when would they get it? Um, and then what if one of them or more than one of them tests positive? So. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Nothing like a complex question, right? So, um, so yeah, let's let's break this down. So, what we're really talking about is a level of risk, right? Because there is no one hundred and ten percent safe way to deal with COVID, especially while you're traveling. So, I I break down the question to really be how can we be our safest. Um, and um, and and really reduce the opportunity for any of the travelers to um, become infected as they travel, and then also those travelers to then infect someone in a high risk group, a, a family member that they are visiting. Um, and then uh, of course, um, it, uh, what role does testing play in all of this? So. Um, if I break it down into risk, the safest way to deal with COVID at all times is, um, is a quarantine sort of situation. And the reason I say that is because testing is not perfect. And so um, let, me, let me describe to you um, how testing can fail you. So when you are exposed to COVID, uh, we believe that you have a, 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 an incubation period that could be anywhere between four to five days to even out to 10 days. So there is this time when you are exposed and you have the disease, but you haven't manifested a high enough viral load. Uh, it hasn't, um, you know, gone to work in your system and, and replicated itself enough for us to have a test that will detect it. And in fact, you may not have even developed symptoms if you even develop symptoms at all, right? And so, um, so that is a, a fallacy, um, a, 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 a sort of downside of testing, right? Is testing has to be done at the right time. And so, um, for example, if someone's traveling and they test themselves before they travel, right? So, so say this is an international travel um, coming from Europe and, and uh, the travelers are tested before they leave. Well, that test um, says that they are not going to infect others while they travel, correct? right? Because that it's going to ensure that they are not spreading it along the way. A test that you would get once you arrive in your destination, again appropriately timed, might tell you that you haven't picked anything up along the way. But again, you've got to hit that right timing. The other part that, uh, of testing that can forsake you, so to speak, is the turnaround time for some uh, tests to result. So we have seen in the past turnaround times stretch out as long as 10 to 14 days, which is beyond a recommended quarantine period anyway. Uh, what we are, are uh, seeing most prevalently right now is a turnaround time of two to three days, which is a lot more palatable. But again, um, if you um, really wait out that incubation time period window, so say you, um, I, I'm, I'm flying over, I get here, I quarantine myself, I wait five days, six days, seven days, whatever, you know, you think is right because there's not a whole lot of science behind this. Um, you get that test and then you're waiting additional days afterwards in which you go right back into quarantine. Um, it may not save you anything, right? You may end up being um, that same quarantine time, um, you know, uh, the, in order to protect your, yourself and those around you um, uh, from um, from any any virus that you may have gotten in your travels. So, 
So I, I'm not sure I, I've given a very optimistic answer for the role testing can play. Um, again, I think the best thing to think about is who are you trying to protect? Because if it's other people from you as you're traveling, maybe that test um, before you go is a great way to, to make sure that you're not traveling unbeknownst with a, an asymptomatic case. But then likewise on the other end is does testing play a significant role? I guess it could if you call all of those things in just the right time frame, but um, it, it, it also could be falsely reassuring if any of those things um, uh, were not uh, done just right. And if you had uh, a large turnaround time, it could negate the whole thing. Um, I can only tell you how much tests cost in relationship to um, to your own insurance companies, meaning um, that most people who do this type of traveling probably have some insurance. Um, and if you have insurance, how we work it within Samaritan is we bill in, an insurance company for a COVID test because all insurance companies cover COVID testing now. We do not um, additionally charge a patient any extra. We just work that out with it with the um, insurance companies. Um, now, if you didn't have insurance, um, you're uninsured. We do have CARES Act funding that allows us to cover the cost of uh, COVID testing that way. So uh, if you did not have insurance, then that um, that test would be covered that way. But again, it's timing of the test and it is um, turnaround times that you have to fit into the whole travel gamut. So, so I, I, I'll, I'll close this off by sort of rounding back around and saying, you know, what's the sure fire safest way to do any traveling? And mind you, traveling is, is dicey right now. Um, in fact, air travel internationally is one of the highest risk things that you can do because of the amount of people you are exposed to along the way, even if you take all safety precautions. So the only way to really be sure about this thing is to do the quarantine on the front end and the back end. Again, for all of those reasons um, that, that I've said, and it's unfortunate that it, it's sort of time because time is what we all tend to have the least amount of, right? And we want to we want a shortcut and we want a way, a surefire way, but unfortunately I can't I can't really tell you that that exists. Um, now the question did come up about what happens if a positive result um, came into being. So if you tested before you left and you found yourself positive, please, please, please don't get on a plane. Um, stay by yourself and, and quarantine um, and um, definitely make sure that uh, you have your, your um, uh, healthcare resources close in case you took a downturn. Um, otherwise, uh, in a lot of cases, this is entirely manageable at home. You just need to make sure that you don't, number one, you don't share it with anyone else um, around you outside your home, but number two, you don't even share it with anyone in your home because there are ways to successfully quarantine yourself in your own home and you do that by um, isolating yourself to a bedroom and bathroom area that only you use, that no one else shares with you, and um, you essentially have your meals and such um, ideally just delivered very quickly um, through a door with masks and everything else on, just, just like you would do it if someone, if you were um, working with non-family members. So, um, so it very much there are ways to be um, uh, to be as safe as possible within your own home, and uh, we all know of circumstances where um, healthcare workers, in particular, who have uh, uh, fallen ill across the United States, have successfully protected their families uh, by doing that sort of uh, home isolation within a family unit. So um, 
If you tested positive on the back end, um, say after you traveled and you then got a positive test, you would likewise need to do the same isolation, uh, the same uh, quarantining of yourself, um, and um, again, away from any family members who may not be positive. Um, the, the bad, uh, I guess the downside would be you wouldn't be in your home environment and you would want to make yourself familiar with um, local uh, health care, local um, hospitals and availability just in case you needed some help to get through um, that infectious period. So um, yeah, so that's what you would do um, for a couple of weeks. Um, now we, we do say if you, um, if you develop symptoms, um, then once you're a febrile um, for, uh, I wanna say, I'd have to look up the recommendations again. I think it's 24 to 48 hours. Um, then, um, and, and you, uh, your symptoms are declining, then um, you can start uh, or you can stop your isolation. And that the CDC has very um, specific recommendations on that, and we follow that even within our healthcare institutions. So um, that is all something that can be very easily looked up, that you can follow those CDC guidelines, that their website is very user friendly. So did I generate any questions off of that? Because that was a mouthful as well. Uh, I, three of them came to my mind, Leslie. Um, so febrile, that means you have a fever? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> I threw out a medical word, didn't I? Yes, yeah, so, uh, so fever. Yeah, so so once you've, um, if you do develop fever, if you do develop cough, you know, all of those um, sorts of uh, uh, symptoms that we associate with COVID, you know, once you see those symptoms wane, then um, uh, you can follow those CDC guidelines for, okay, when can I get back out and, and uh, I know I'm not infectious anymore? And, and then if a person is traveling and it's on the back end of the travel, so they are not at home um, and they needed to quarantine, most likely they would just have to do it in a hotel room. Is that right? Correct, correct. Unless they, unless they have, you know, differing accommodations, if you're, you know, staying in a, in a family home or, or something like that, hopefully there, is, there are ways to, you know, get away from the remainder of the family and really, um, you know, utilize, you know, complete isolation. Um, if, if meals, you know, are delivered and things, you always use masks and um, gloves, um, you know, for even meal delivery. Um, that, that's what has been successful uh, in case studies. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and the third question I had, something else came up, came, to me as you were talking, and I'm sorry I have lost it now. So come <laughs> back, back, I will ask. Did anybody else have any, oh, I remember you, um, in order to get a, um, a COVID test with Samaritan, you have to have a doctor's order, right? Oh yes, yes, that is the, the other great point to bring up. Um, because we have um, never had across the United States the amount of tests uh, available when we all wanted them. Um, we have never had um, that type of um, quantity um, so that we could all just get tested whenever we wanted to get tested. Um, the method that we've come up with um, by and large across the United States is um, to have the, the uh, physicians and other uh, types of clinicians like PAs and, and nurse practitioners be the gatekeepers for that testing. So um, still in our area, that is exactly how we, um, we are uh, making sure that we have testing available for those who need it the most. And um, that can be obtained, however, through a primary care provider uh, order. It, uh, you can have an e-visit. Uh, it's as simple as, as something like that. 
um, with a provider to verify that you have all of the right reasons um, to order a test. Um, it could be as simple as going to a, a, an urgent care or walk-in clinic setting. Uh, certainly ERs have testing available, but I would not advise that if you're asymptomatic or, or just looking for a test. There's there's definitely easier ways to um, to get that order than um, than going to the highest level of care. But all of those places uh, have that ability to um, to do that testing and to have that doctor's order. Okay. Does, does anybody um, I there's nothing in the chat and, and there are no hands raised, but does anybody on the phone have a question, a follow up question about COVID? Ursula, I do you see that Brian B has his hand raised. I yeah. see it now. Yep. Go ahead, Brian. Uh, OK. I, I guess um, well, I'm going to follow up with one. I have two or three questions, but uh, just following up on the last one you just said about getting a doctor's recommendation. Now, if, if these travelers are coming in uh you know and they wanted to have it tested just because of um uh, because they they're concerned about you know whether they're infected could they actually get a doctor's recommendation after they travel like if they come came to down to the to the coast somewhere and and uh could they walk in, like you say, to, to some clinic there and say we've we've come down, we've come, we've traveled, you know, from Europe, and uh, uh, we'd like to get a test just to make sure we're we're you know we're safe. Especially since they're high risk. Uh, because they're going to visit some high risk uh, relatives. So right. is that something they can actually? Uh, some doctors will do that for them. Oh yes, absolutely, and and the reason why is because they hit all of those categories. Those, uh, you know, uh, high. They've engaged in a high risk activity. They could have possibly come into contact with multiple people who have COVID uh, along the way, and um, and that even if they're asymptomatic, that is uh, one of those indications for testing. Absolutely, is okay, um, and and exposure to other high risk individuals. Yep. Okay, great. Um, the, the second question regarding testing. There, I guess there are different types of testing you've heard about. One of the things we've heard about is uh, some uh, self-administered tests that um, that uh, you know there are a couple of them available apparently. So are those uh, tests uh, effective or as effective as one you get uh, you know in a clinic? Yeah, so you uh, you identified uh, uh, another very good thing to be aware of. So um, so what you want to make sure of is when you're when you're testing for COVID that you're asking for the right test. So the the test that you want to ask for and, and this tests your status with COVID at that time at the time you take the test, uh, a molecular or PCR test. Um, and um, that is going to be your most accurate type of test. Now that can be available either um, from a nasopharyngeal swab, a nasal swab, and now most recently from saliva. And so um, all of those tests, uh, as long as they're that molecular um, uh, or polymerase chain reaction, that's what PCR stands for, PCR type of test, um, they are considered fairly equitable um, as as far as their efficacy. Um, now, um, there's a couple of different other types of tests, and this is ones you would not be interested in in that um, scenario. So you, you would not want an antibody test. An antibody test is going to tell you um, if you have um, developed antibodies to COVID-19, that means have you had a prior infection? And so um, in this case, you probably don't care. I mean, maybe that's interesting trivia, but really what you care about is are you infectious now? And so that's, um, you, you definitely want to um, make sure that you're asking for the right test. There are other antigen tests 
meaning it's looking for COVID, but it's not as um, as uh, efficacious as the molecular or PCR test. So you, you do need to inquire, what type of test am I getting? And um, the I, I will say um, still that nasopharyngeal swab is considered um, like sort of the gold standard. Uh, that is still our fallback for um, uh, what we, uh, if we really truly want the best test, but again, uh, we're seeing nasal swabs and, and saliva be um, just about as good. And I think that's the way of the future. Just like you just identified, uh, Brian, we um, are seeing companies now that are providing, um, just like you can get a home DNA test, um, you can, you know, spit in a cup now and uh, send that off and uh, and get a COVID test uh, that way as well. And so I think that this is uh, more and more of those types of tests that we'll see in the future uh, will be um, uh, just along those lines. So the uh, the future holds for us, uh, especially by Christmas, I would think that the, the only way to get a test would not just be, you know, through your doctor, but again, through some of these, um, these mail-in services. Um, what the consideration should be with those is again, just make sure what type of test you're getting and um, make sure that you understand the transit time because um, you want to incorporate that into your plan, right? So you want to make sure that your incubation time has been given long enough from the, the time that you um, might have been exposed to at least four or five days out from that. So the, from the time you got off the flight and got into a quarantine situation four to five days later before you take the test and then um, how you send the test off and um, and then how you would get those results, you would um, then, you know, sort of calculate that time in, in, you know, in all of this bubble. And then you can really make it an educated guess on, hey, do I just want to quarantine for two weeks or would I really get any additional information from this process? Would it save me any time or effort? I, okay, I guess I have one last question. Now, on the worst case is if they do test positive or they do come out with symptoms in uh, six, seven days, whatever. Um, did you say there, there are hotels or other places that they could go to and would they be accepted in, in uh, you know, public places like hotels or uh, are there places that will accept them if they if they have the um, symptoms or if they tested positive? Well, I think all hotels right now are operating under the um, uh, under the, the assumption that people are people have COVID that stay there and perhaps they're uh, asymptomatic or even symptomatic, right? Because all of their cleaning procedures all of um, all of the the ways that they are um, spacing out uh, uh, their um, uh, their guests and and how they stay, how they clean, all of that is keyed to COVID. Um, and um, in, in fact, the hotel industry has had to do some pretty dramatic changes. So I don't think there's anybody who would um, turn away anyone because again, they're considering um, most everybody to be infectious um, and, and in some cases unknowingly infectious to other people. So um, so that's their assumption. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. I think that really is very helpful and has answered all our questions for now. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. We have a couple more COVID related questions. One, how many people are being tested monthly? I believe that means in Lincoln County. Yes, so I was just going to pull that information up because I get a daily accounting. And um, let's see. Um, so it looks like um, we have 
and, and I, I get it per hospital. So in the Newport area, and that's sort of Depot Bay South, um, we've had a total sum of all tests of 4,390. Um, and then let me look and see. Um, in our morning brief this morning, we had um, we had um, for North Lincoln. Let me uh, find that here. Got a little too much email going on. <laughs> I'll look that up and and uh, and I I. I assume it's a, another uh, few thousand to add on to that. So it's not like we're testing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people, you know, every day. Um, there was a time when we had our worst outbreak that we did test hundreds of people per day, but that was mostly in workplace uh, settings. And in a lot of cases, we brought in outside agencies to do that. Um, testing uh, and it was not done through Samaritan. Samaritan has tended to do the onesies um, or twosies, although we have um, had some of the fishing fleet come through and and we've done um, some of that work um, that way. But um, let me see. I don't know why I can't um, find that, but I'll continue to, to look. So but that's um, that's just an idea of how many you know uh, we've tested across our our county then we have a another question and um, that is speaking of antibodies and testing is anything known on whether or not our bodies retain the antibodies or if they eventually disappear Yes, we are learning more and more about that. And uh, yes, we do believe that uh, that we develop those antibodies because we can detect them. Um, the The biggest unknown is how long they last. Um, there's theories that um, they can go away in, in, in as little as um, a few months even. Um, and um, that's sort of sad because we would all like it if they hung on for a lot longer because uh, the the meaning for that is um, is certainly uh, the ultimate question that leads you to is can I get COVID-19 again, um, you know, after a period of time? And it looks like the answer to that is yes. Um, the catch is that we don't have that um, definite information about exactly how long these uh, antibodies are lasting, but the theory is um, months, not years. Um, so if that that's in any way helpful. Yeah, you, can, you can't let the, the vigilance down even after you've had it. Um, uh, we definitely um, you know, uh, uh, have to maintain the vigilance for for not getting it again. Does, it, does anybody have any other follow up questions regarding COVID or regarding the wildfires? I do. OK, go ahead. So my question is, um, could you please clarify where the testing is done? Are they currently our primary care physicians or PAs or NPs? Are they doing it or do you have to go to the COVID testing site? Ah, uh, that's a very good question. Um, yes, because of the volumes um, of testing, um, even though it's not hundreds per day, um, you know, it, it would be quite a bit of uh, work for our primary care providers to do that sort of testing within their offices. It would be a lot of training, a lot of use of personal protective equipment. And so, yes, we have routed people uh, largely through our COVID testing sites, our drive-through testing sites. 
um, because uh, number one, that um, protects our healthcare workers um, a, a little bit more. Of course, we do the same thing as hotels do, right? We assume that everybody with respiratory symptoms and even those, some of those who don't have symptoms have the disease. And so you will see us always masked. If we are seeing patients, we have our eye protection on as well. Um, lots of personal protective equipment usage. But if we are testing people for COVID, we're in even more stuff. Um, and so uh, you can see um, those COVID testing sites. People are in um, uh, powered air purifying uh, respirator setups. They look like spacemen almost. Um, and, and that is to um, just separate them completely from this mass of con, uh, contagious people of some sort, right, who are coming through and, and who um, in a lot of cases do have COVID. So yes, we are routing those people through our, um, our drive through So basically you talk to your primary care provider, you have an e-visit online, um, uh, something along that and, and um, you are sent to that collection site then to actually get the test done. And those hours are, are very convenient, hopefully. And the other thing that it can do for you, especially if you do an e-visit, it isolates you, right? Because you're, you're wanting a test for some reason. You think you have it. And so one of the safest ways to prevent anyone else from getting it is to stay away from everyone else. And so one of those ways that you can get that, that test ordered and get um, a, a, a test itself without even going in anywhere and without being exposed to anybody except someone in a full respirator is to do an e-visit and then a, um, a drive-through um, testing and then otherwise isolate yourself completely and make sure that um, that you are not contagious to anyone else while you're you're going through that testing. And, and uh, those drive-through sites. And those drive-through sites now are in um, Newport and Lincoln City. I have a question the hospital. I, Ursula, I, I have a question. I see that Barb has a question. Mm -hmm. Yes, <laughs> yes, I do. Um, and it is in reference to the antibody. I have um, one family member, a grandson, whose whole family was very ill for a number of weeks. Um, this was just prior to the identification of it or diagnosis of it in Seattle. He's curious as to whether they do have the antibodies, and if so, are we still treating people and patients with the plasma from those who have had antibody tests? Yeah, so very interesting. Uh, I, I too had a really bad um, uh, uh, upper respiratory um, uh, sort of episode in January, and I was like, hmm, mm -hmm. could it have been? It was, it was just much more harsh than than normal. Um, right. I did give blood, and uh, I did have an antibody test that came back negative. Was that entirely um, accurate, though? It depends, right? because if this was a January scenario and antibodies only last a number of months, could I have had it and then uh, the antibodies not be present anymore? Possibly. Um, uh, also, um, I could have not had it at all. and <laughs> I've been an entirely accurate antibody right. test. So again, it's, it's, it's a sort of a timing thing, um, but um, that is one easy way that um, is a win-win that I could advocate for. If someone is looking for an antibody test, you can get that through the Red Cross with a blood donation. And um, since we're in need of blood, I would highly advocate that that, that is a way to get a free test and um, help uh, our, our system um, across the United States with that the need for blood. Um, so yeah, so it's it's sort of a, an interesting thing to get, but uh, it's not by no means infallible and by no means do we have the complete science behind it. Uh, that too is a, is a, 
if you did not go through the Red Cross or some other way, that way you would need a doctor's order to get that antibody test. But okay. that test is run out of our, within our system, within Samaritan Health Services, it is um, run out of our Lebanon site. So we have a specific machine that, that runs uh, COVID antibody testing. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, any any other questions uh, regarding anything? <laughs> Throw me I, one. <laughs> okay, Carla, go ahead. My question is, um, is related to the fires and the number of employees that are uh, most severely affected by the fires. So my question is really, do you have a feel for how many employees on the, in the coastal hospitals have lost their homes or are currently displaced still? And also, do you can you sort of recap um, in what way Samaritan is helping those employees? Yeah, thanks, Carla. That is just such a super important question um, because uh, our, our employees have been so affected, um, uh, particularly at North Lincoln Hospital. We haven't had um, uh, anyone that we're tracking at Pacific Communities Hospital, but at North Lincoln Hospital, we have around 30 individuals that have been impacted, um, some to the point where they have lost their homes completely, um, some where their homes are uninhabitable, even though they're still standing, and some have just continued to be displaced and, and um, are, are still searching for full information, although they're getting more and more of that every day because um, you might have seen our, our wonderful sheriff's office, um, you know, uh, offering to to um, either take people back to their properties or um, scout out the properties themselves and try to get people information, even from those um, really hot zones, that the, the evacuation zones that are, um, that are still underway. Uh, but unfortunately, we have uh, totaled up 12 people who have definitively lost their homes completely. Um, and um, we're working with many more to try to see, um, uh, you know, of that 30, what resources do they need? Um, what we've done is uh, we're, we're very lucky that a federal disaster was declared because this allows us to take things even a step further. We have employee assistance. Um, and we've long had funds through our foundations that have supported employees when, when um, sometimes tragic things happen in their lives and sometimes even daily things um, that, that get out of hand, everything from too many bills to, to um, a disaster. But in this case, because this was such an overwhelming disaster, uh, we were allowed to um, to really maximize those funds again because of the the disaster declaration and um, we were able to give up to five thousand dollars tax-free to people who have lost their homes and up to three thousand um, dollars if uh, they were renters and lost their homes and a, a lot of that we have to work through qualification um, you know we have to do a lot of verification a lot of this is hands on one on one work with um, some of our employees and and we sort of laughed that many of our foundation people and our HR people have become social workers and that's OK because that has, has been exactly what we've needed. But we have partnered with um, everyone from Bymart to Goodwill to um, to to donors to try to figure out how are we going to you know impact um in, in in a positive way as fast as possible you know these these people who um who really need our help in addition we've been trying to facilitate temporary housing for them while they could get their insurance um underway um, this money that we're able to give them and we've already handed out um i believe eight of the checks um, of the the 12 that will be getting them 
um, that money allows them to pay deductibles to um, sort of get their um, their housing for today, you know, under um, under way and and um, and form plans that they might not be able to to do otherwise. And so we're we're um, definitely not the end all be all. We're helping people understand what FEMA will provide for them, what uh, housing and urban development programs will provide for them. We're um, thinking about their um, stress levels and mental health needs as they go through this. We're thinking about their extended families. Do their children need counseling? You know, we're trying to just provide a whole packet of information for people um, and ongoing touch base and ongoing care um, because it is so important um, that that uh, we take care of these folks because they have taken care of um, our community for years and years and years in some cases. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, I don't see any other hands, although it looks like I might have a little bit of a delay. We are actually, it's 1259. Does anybody have any last minute? <laughs> last burning, questions. <laughs> burning question you've got to have answered. Well, if not, I thank you so much for, for tuning in, for, um, for finding me interesting enough to spend your lunch hour with. And um, I hope that I have provided some information, some tidbit that, um, that is interesting or helpful. And, um, and thank you so much. Uh, we, we really appreciate um, the, the time and attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Ogden, for spending this time with us and enlightening us as always. OK, if, if people have other questions, you can always email your foundation uh, team and uh, we'll make sure that we get those answered for you. We'll we'll talk to you all later. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Bye. <laughs>